Greetings and welcome to Mount Olympus. I am Hercules Invictus and tonight I welcome you to Hercules and the Space Gods. We will be examining the UFO entity Enigma and we will be exploring the question as to who the UFO entities report to. What is their plan for being here? And are there many different plans? Do they conflict with one another? Are they working in cooperation with one another? Um, I don't quite know, and I'm really hoping to find out. And we have a wonderful group of people here assembled to explore that question. We have Tim Schwartz, the living legend, and uh, the publisher of Santar Press. Um, and we have uh, Setna Kamwast of Kemet, also known as Michael K. L. Waterman, who represents the ancient Egyptian uh, tradition. We have Brian Walker from Brian's Drive-In Theater, and he has his pulse on popular culture. And then entering our arena, we have Mark and Phyllis Brinkerhoff, uh, who are in communion with outer space forces. Uh, so everyone will explore what they've discovered, and I'll share a little bit about what, uh, what I know at the end, if we have time. So without further ado, we have Tim Schwartz. Greetings, Tim. How are you, old legend? Uh, hi, Hercules. Thank you very much for having me on tonight. It's uh, always a pleasure uh, to uh, be with you and with uh, everybody else that uh, uh, Brian Setna and the uh, uh, Brinkenhoffs. It's uh, uh, just always, always fantastic to be able to talk with everyone. And uh, Setna, how are you? Oh, I'm terrific. I'm nice and warm. I know others cannot say the same. <laughs> no, definitely not. It's uh, beyond a little chilly. <laughs> it's, it's, I'm going to be mean. It's 46 degrees here, and it's about 20 where you guys are. And you have snow, and I don't. Well, I, I, I'm glad for you. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, how are you? Oh, sore from shoveling about eight inches of snow out of my driveway this afternoon, but otherwise <laughs> fine. How are you? <laughs> Wish I'd gotten as much exercise as you did today. <laughs> you know, when we first bought our house, one of the things I liked about it the most was that it was set back from the street. Hmm. And <laughs> I wasn't thinking, oh, God, I've got this giant driveway that's about, you know, 25 feet wide <laughs> at the top of it. <laughs> When we lived in Pennsylvania, uh, we lived in the mountains in the Poconos. Uh, yes. Mm. Uh, when, it's, no. when it snowed very often, uh, I had to dig outside the door, the landing, down the stairs, across the sidewalk, up another flight of stairs, uh, up the curved parking area to where we had the car parked in the port. Uh, and uh, if, if if we were lucky, it would take me like an hour and a half <laughs> to do that. And mm -hmm. then luckier uh the uh town would have plowed the street if the plow if the plow came and didn't uh, remove the stone the street then despite all my hard work we were stuck there until <laughs> so was that the ninth labor of hercules <laughs> no, so 247 <laughs> and mark how are you and phyllis is invisible today will she or will she yeah. yeah she's invisible she I was know, she's over in another expanse I love the snow talk because we come from upstate New York and it was a nightmare in the old days. <gasps> Not as bad today, but we had blizzards and I had a shovel driveway into a road because we lived on a slope. So if you came down the road, you wanted to get into the driveway. And if you didn't, I had a tire to bump a tree. I mean, it was bizarre. <laughs> okay. I remember sanding and everything and snow blowers. No. And I, <laughs> Hi, Michael. No how are you? More. <laughs> no more. Tonight's topic, hey, everybody. Tonight's topic, Mark, is uh, who do the UFO entities report to? So I'm looking forward to hearing uh, your perspective on that uh, as well. And okay. we're going to start with uh, Tim. Uh, Tim is a researcher of many, many years, and uh, I'm sure he has some uh, uh, very interesting perspectives on this topic. Uh, well, Hercules, um... I got nothing. So you, you can just go on to the next one. No, no, no. Uh, <laughs> I do want to say, though, that uh, 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 
and not to rub this in anyone's nose, we were fortunate here in southern Indiana that um, we only got a dusting of snow here. Uh, there was actually more snow south of us in uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Tennessee, Kentucky, even Texas, I guess, got more snow than we did. But it's been so cold that I don't think that uh, I, I had to get out yesterday but uh, that's that's been the only time, and if I could just spend the rest of, you know, how, however long it's going to stay cold inside, then I, I would be happy. So yeah, <laughs> uh, that's uh, that's it for winter for me, you know. But uh, I I don't know if I would, uh, even though I do like warm weather, I don't know if I'd want to move south, because as Setna was saying, uh, there was a ten foot alligator. Uh, not too far away from his apartment. And I'm not sure if um, I want to go outside and find a 10-foot alligator. <laughs> well, it was behind a fence. I had to, oh, I had to preface that. Okay, behind a fence, yeah. And and um, a 10-foot alligator, I'm sure, could probably uh, take down a fence pretty easily if it really wanted mm -hmm. to get at you. <laughs> Our ancient alien theorists might say we also climb or who exist on the other side of the fence are reptoids mm. that's why alligators there in the, in the winter yep <laughs> that's right that's right well you know it's it's an interesting subject um the idea that uh, uh, the UFO phenomena and the so-called uh, UFO entities that have been associated with them um, might have a hierarchy, possibly, you know, or, or that the ones that we're dealing with are a facade or are not the actual uh, 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 not the real alien, so to speak. And it makes, it makes me think of the old, and I hate to say old, but, uh, it came out in the, uh, seventies, uh, a British science fiction television show, uh, pro by, by Gary Anderson and his company called UFO. And, uh, it, oh, yeah. it, it it only lasted one season and the, they were going to do a second season, but instead it turned into space 1999. Mm -hmm. But in that television show, and I'm, and I'm sorry, Brian, I'm, 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 I'm going with uh, uh, pop culture and start out with here uh, uh, on, on this subject. Uh, but I think it's relevant because the, the aliens were portrayed as being humanoid. You never really, you, you saw them, but they were always in a space suit. And when they actually caught one and dissected it, they found out that it was made up of bits and pieces from earth humans. That one of the reasons, or they really were quite sure the reason that they were here but one reason was here is that we were being harvested for body parts and then close to the end of the series they decided that they had we had yet to run into the actual aliens the actual brains behind the whole operation and and mark i'm going to have to uh, uh with apologies uh, uh uh to mark but you know there has been a lot of speculation through the years yeah. along the same lines when it comes to the ufo phenomena that what we have been seeing here in associated with ufos and especially like you know a lot of the landed uh, 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 situations where people, you know, will run across a landed UFO and the occupants are out, you know, running around doing things that these may not actually be the true aliens. And uh, it, it, it makes me think of the uh, UFO researcher, Daryl Sims. And uh, uh, he told me one time that it was, it was his idea that everything that we have seen that uh, would be, you know, as we would consider, you know, uh, extraterrestrials or aliens are actually um, 
entities that were created by the real aliens in order to operate here on Earth. And that was why you would have like the insectoids and the, the reptoids and, and some of these other weird creatures because they were based on earthly DNA that they would gather, you know, DNA from here, create these creatures then to do the work on Earth because the real extraterrestrials, whatever their form would be, would not be able to operate on our planet for, you know, the various obvious reasons, you know, we couldn't deal with the atmosphere, gravity, uh, uh, like H.G. Wells, the germs, uh, uh, that sort of thing. And I, you know, I always thought that that may explain a lot when it, when it comes to the, the, the many different aspects of the UFO phenomena. And it's something that John Keel wrote about uh, uh, quite a bit. And, you know, I, I really did come from the John Keel uh, uh, school. Uh, him and Brad Steiger were probably the, yeah. the, the two authors that uh, I glommed, to, glommed on to really early on. And they both had uh, a big influence uh, on my research and, and my writing. But um, Keel especially around the time that uh, he was doing the, his, his research on uh, Mothman at Pe uh, Point Pleasant, West Virginia. He was also involved with a, a really bizarre series of, of UFO and occupant reports that were going on um, on Long Island, uh, Long Island, New York. And he, he was working with a DJ uh, uh, at a small radio station who, whose name was Jane Paro. I think that's how you pronounce her name. P-A-R-O. And, um, and then some other people who surfaced with the same kind of stories. And, you know, it's, you could write a, a, a an even more bizarre movie than the Mouthman prophecies based on the stuff that Keel was going through when he was doing all of this Long Island uh, uh, research. Uh, and, and it was, it was this stuff that led John to come up with the idea that the UFO phenomena may actually, and, and, and he started calling the, uh, the, the beings associated with it ultra terrestrials. Uh, because he felt that these things weren't extraterrestrials as we think of them. He didn't think that they were visitors from other planets, but that they were actually another intelligence that comes from like some other kind of uh, a field of energy from a reality that may be uh, close to ours, but not actually part of ours. And that for some reason, somehow, they are able, albeit briefly, to um, gain life, get, gain a modicum of intelligence, because he always felt that these things were more like um, robots, so to speak, that uh, they weren't really thinking too much on their own, that they were following a, 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 a pattern of influence that was given from some other source, and that they were playing, as he put it, ridiculous games that could be influenced by the thoughts of the people who were participating in this, uh, himself included. So, you know, when, when it comes to this and, and I, and I know that, you know, people may be coming, uh, uh to listen to this, hoping that we'd actually be able to, you know, pro provide some definitive answers to this. Uh, but I think that, uh, it's still part of that, that big unknown that is, ever present over the UFO phenomena, that we don't really know uh, what the source is, or, or even what the ultimate goal of this is, if there even is a goal. Uh, and, and back to Keel again, you know, Keel thought that um, whatever the source of this, 
the the ultimate intelligence he thought it was mad he, you know he said it was crazy and that that kind of went to uh, uh like um um charles fort you know who, who 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 speculated that the earth was controlled by some kind of mad god and uh uh keel kind of uh um uh reflected that thoughts of fort that uh, that whatever we're dealing with is playing some sort of mad game that it is it is even sure uh, what it's up to um because a lot of the a lot of the situations that were coming from these silent contactees as as keel called them uh, uh, uh people who were having contacts with some other kind of intelligence but never wanted it publicized and only a few people such as keel or or maybe some close family members ever knew that these people were experiencing some kind of bizarre phenomena and uh uh, uh for instance, these these beings were playing some kind of bizarre game that involved uh, 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 several women who were pregnant, and these women were told that their pregnancies were the result of some kind of genetic manipulation by the aliens, and that they were going to be given birth to a um, a hybrid human extraterrestrial child that would be a messiah so to speak and that uh, uh, eventually these women were uh, found themselves being kidnapped taken to like abandoned houses somewhere on long island where in the basements were all kinds of uh, uh, wonderful machinery and uh, uh, one group was there say to help the pregnancy along and then there was another group uh, uh, an evil group that was going to come along and try to snatch this infant from them uh before uh before it was born to to pre prevent the messiah the outer space messiah from being uh, uh born uh, but it it was it was all just a game so to speak um uh, uh, uh i guess one of these uh, women ended up not being pregnant at all she had like a, a a false pregnancy even though she was showing uh, uh physically and then the other woman had a baby that was it was a baby and after the baby was born then all of this activity ceased and uh you know so you had this and, and other even more crazy stories if you know if you could believe they could get even more bizarre so i'll just i'll just say hercules that uh, um and and you know i welcome anyone who you know wants to ask question along these lines that uh, you know we're dealing with a phenomena that is not forthcoming on its goals origins or anything like that e there could not there may not even be any uh that you know there there is uh, and and as keel speculated that um that these whatever this intelligence is is that it's it's very much like uh, an, an automation that for whatever reasons things will set it off and it will produce phenomena that takes on a reality in our own albeit briefly plays its game takes on these roles spacemen gods men in black whatever and uh, and then once people get involved and um, caught up in it all to the point where they're actually um, believing in it to the core, to their heart, then it disappears and never shows up again, leaving everybody just basically, you know, hanging over the cliff. Uh, and, and we've seen this with some UFO contactees who uh, would go and make very public predictions I about, like say, like the landing uh, of, of craft. Tim, but, go ahead. Uh, we only have 10 minutes for everybody. Uh, 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 and uh, would go, I, I would love to continue this. Would you like to do a whole show on this? Oh, uh, possibly. <laughs> you could probably talk me into it. <laughs> but let's, let's, let's look at our schedules, because I'm just going to say a sentence, because we have limited time. Sure. Uh, 
in the first thing that Tim uh, Beckley published of mine, mm -hmm. I shared that in uh, Olympian spirituality, we're not here to be good. We're not here to worship. We're here to entertain the gods. <laughs> so we're entertainment. Yes. Uh, so I've thought along these lines for a very long time. I knew John Keel. I was a member of his, uh, um, his uh, uh, Fordian Society in uh, New York City. Uh, and uh, Brad Steiger was on several of my podcasts mm -hmm. before when he was still alive and still with us. Um, and we were planning a podcast around the time that he uh, passed. Mm. Um, so uh, I think very highly of them too. And they've, they've formed very powerful influences as me on me as well. And thank you. I, I, I was, I, I, I want to explore this so, so much. We will be in touch and let's do it. Let's do a whole show just on this topic. Okay. Let's do that. That's great. Thank you. And I apologize. No, no problem. We have 10 minutes for everybody. Um, Setna. Yes. You are well versed in the mysteries of ancient Kemet and also the paranormal mysteries of the here and the now. Uh, what is your wisdom on uh, this question? We're talking about it. I'm going to take it from a Kemetic point of view. And I want to show this, especially to Mark. This is Temu. He is a higher force. They call him the, the divine master. Um, as you can see, he looks like he's sitting in a spaceship. And he's holding on to devices on either side. He's carrying an ankh, which is a symbol for life. There seems to be flames coming from where he's sitting. So he's in a com command center. And I noticed this a long time ago. This is on the back of what's called the Mirror of Hathor, which is a, a device which is used to send negative energy back to its source. But I wanted you to see this. Um, Especially Mark and Phyllis. What do you think of this, guys? Are you there? I'm muted. I don't want to make <laughs> noise when you guys are talking. Well, don't make any noise, but I want to know. This is a command center, and I thought you'd know, of of all people, you would recognize this. It's, it's ancient, but it's not ancient. He has a light source on top of his head. That's not what that is, as you know. I know. He's carrying, um, he's po pointing to different directions of instrument panel, instrumentation. And he's sitting on what I would think is the the back, the a, a rocket as he goes forward into his direction. But he's called the control master. And his name is Tamu, kind of like a new store um, <laughs> an app that you get things will keep <laughs> and free. But um, which I was insulted by because Tamu is supposed to be the all high, the high master. And this, this struck me as I was, you know, I'm still unpacking. I finally unpacked all my crystal balls, which is kind of fun. Um, and they're also an energy. Each one of these is, I'm going to say in a crazy way, are a friend of mine. They are all alive. They have spiritual energy. They are they are going to be here for millions of years yep. in this form. All the and crystals. Are here. Yeah. yeah, you're here to I, help. But crystals. I wanted to, yes. I wanted you to see Tamu, and I wanted your opinion because I trust you so very much because I know you and I have a similar situation with our births. Yeah, weird. It, it's definitely, remember, that's ancient, and symbology is what they used back then. So what they yeah. could see, maybe they were on the ship. Remember, Ezekiel was taken on a ship, taken somewhere else. Everybody in their ancient time has some way of you know, carving or whatever they're going to do with the art. And that's why, it, to me, when I see all these carvings from the ancient times and the pyramids and more, it's obvious what it is to me. But they were visitors. I thought, and they I were thought it would be. Working and I together. wanted to get your input because I knew the moment you saw that, you'd go, aha. Because I knew that, you know, yeah. you of all people, you would relate to that energy. Oh. I have around me, I don't know if you can see them all, many, many crystals. And I also yes. have my, co my cobalt. This crystal I got in a place called Star Magic many, many years ago. Love that store. Cobalt. That was a great store. Oh, yeah. My friend Eric was one of the salespeople there. Um, I've lost touch. But this is cobalt and also um, it's called thallium green. And it's been blasted into this crystal um, and superheated it so that this will work. This crystal is the most, is the strongest of them all. 
This was from Samuel Weiser's. I bought it for $350. It's actually worth 10 times that now. And it, you can't get it anymore. This one comes from Bloomingdale's. <laughs> it was made by the Atlantis Corporation. It's numbered and signed. It's rock crystal, so it's a, it's a rock. This guy, Mark, is... His name is Hal, Ham, H-A-H-M, and he's extremely, extremely powerful, but he's my talking crystal, and he would relate to you. He has been in this body for 4,000 years. Um, he went from human form to crystal form, and I think many of the high masters, like in the movie Superman, have become crystals so that they can vibrate and work with us that way. The other thing I was going to say that Tim mentioned, the movie that he's talking about that happened on Long Island is a film called Entity. And they have a very strange thing that enters the, the lead actress and she becomes pregnant. Um, I grew up on Long Island. I experienced, I told you about this flying chandelier that I saw when I was a child, which I have not seen here in Savannah yet. The last time I saw it was over, I was in the West Village. And I was looking out over the Hudson River and I saw it and it shot back at me like, Michael, we're still here. And it was it was an amazing energy. And um, it's what led me here to Savannah. The reason I'm here is all my life I was told move to Savannah, Georgia. I don't I didn't know anybody here. I didn't know anything about it except that it was in Georgia and it's got a you know, it's got a really haunted history. But the energy here is so strong and so positive and beautiful that I now know this is my home. And I know the gods of Egypt. I feel I'm in a direct line to my, my Egyptian masters. And I know that they are so happy that I'm in this environment. And after all, I've got palm trees. I've got sand. It looks like Egypt. Yes. <laughs> it's a whole yeah. lot politically, politically safer. Well, kind of, you know, we won't get there. Okay. But so I wanted to bring that to everybody's attention that that energy's here, you know. And Tim, I was going to say, did you see this? What do you think of this? Yes, yes. Well, you know, and I was thinking that uh, the um, underneath him uh, could represent like lines of force, uh, 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 either you know, uh, acting as a form of transport. Or are him even being um, able to um, travel, not physically, but as light? Well, that's what I think. And I think yeah. that's why they put it on the back of a mirror. Mm -hmm. Because it has this energy. Um, the Egyptians don't talk about Temu. They're almost afraid to. They there are very few writings about him, um, and he very very few images. This is one of the few images. It's from a tomb, but they found this um, huge huge brass and gold plate and hammered in the tomb of a. Of, I think he's a fourth dynasty or third. I'm sorry, twelfth dynasty pharaoh called Numes, and um, it's not explained. It's just kind of there on a table as if the, the Pharaoh was working on it and then he died or transcended in some way. And then all of a sudden, the, this thing appeared, this object appeared. Um, this Pharaoh was considered not human. His skin was an odd texture. His, it was a, a gray, green, brown coloring. He didn't look like the rest of the Egyptians. Um, he's an interesting being. Um, he always wore on top of his head two hands like this, like an almost like an antenna. And there was supposed to be a crystal in the middle. When they found a statue of him, the crystal was taken away. Hmm. But it's very interesting. Again, he was a, considered a control or a master. And on that note, thank you very much, Setna. We have to move on to Brian. And the UFOs are reporting to who, Brian, according to American Cinema? Well, according to American cinema, I, I guess it really depends on the era during which uh, we were talking about said films. Uh, in the 1950s, often what you found were 
uh, just sort of, uh, you know, worker bees or minions uh, who were uh, making the journey from uh, their, uh, you know, home planet to ours. And oftentimes it was, um, oh, let's say it, uh, out of concern for uh, the way that uh, the beings of Earth had been acting, uh, meaning World War II. Uh, and uh, you get that uh, familiar trope in a lot of science fiction movies, but particularly the, the day the Earth stood still. Uh, I think that's a good one. Uh, the original one, I, I guess I should say, with Michael Rennie and uh, Patricia Neal. Uh, you, you, he was, Michael Rennie is more or less an emissary. You know, he's, he's not, um, yeah, he doesn't really have any ill intentions. Uh, and later on in uh, American cinema, you, you find you know, very ill-intentioned um, alien life forms you know, visiting the U.S. Actually, that very same year, uh, The Day the Earth Stood Still is a uh, film from 1951. That very same year, uh, The Thing from Another World, and one of my top 10 favorite science fiction horror films. Um, it's a, a brilliant film. It's uh, Kenneth Toby. Uh, he's the uh, lead actor in it, a character actor from you know way back. Um, but the thing uh, itself, um, I, I, I hate to uh, ascribe any kind of sex to it because uh, the thing it from the thing from another world uh, is actually a uh, plant form. The producers, and I know if, you, if you've seen, and I'm sure you probably have seen the film, uh, it's James Arness from Gunsmoke. Um, only he sort of has, he doesn't really look like plant, plant life so much. Uh, they, they try to attach some of that to him. He, he still looks very menacing, but uh, originally the producers wanted something much more elaborate and just, you know, in 1951, getting something like that on film. It uh, just wasn't a possibility, and I think they were um, looking at uh, James Arness in a costume, but but it works. It's an incredibly frightening film, uh, and uh, he, he makes a very menacing creature. If you uh, go back and you know, research any uh, on uh, UFO sightings uh, in the USA, you know, practically since um, you know, the dawn of man, uh, there have been you know, recorded sightings uh, of UFOs. Um, they became m much more prevalent after World War II. I, I don't know if uh, indeed, uh, much like uh, Michael Rennie uh, would, would have said in The Day the Earth Stood Still, if it was because of World War II and all the calamity and the, you know, the atomic bomb, um, I don't know if that was, uh, you know, one of the reasons for, um, you know, more visits from uh, you know different planets and such, uh, but the uh, if you look at the history of it, it really picks up around 1947. I mean, Roswell happened in 1947, but there were uh, you know, many events that year uh, that were reported. Um, and you know, if you've if you've ever known anybody who uh, does a lot of flying, a lot of them, a lot of these people will tell you that hey, you know, hey I saw something I you know, couldn't. Uh, quite explained. And um, you do see uh, things like that. If you, I mean, a lot of people will, um, if you look at, what am I trying to say? If you look at um, people's uh, accounts of UFO sightings, um, oftentimes uh, they will be stationary or, you know, and they, they will see something, you know, go across the sky. Other times it's a much more intimate um, encounter. Uh, with the UFO. And uh, one of my favorite uh, terrible films, Plan 9 from Outer Space, uh, probably has the least inventive UFOs on Earth. It's the only UFO I could name that uh, has curtains inside. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> shower Which, I mean, curtains, no less. <laughs> well, yeah, well, that, that the shower curtain, I think, is in the airplane where... Uh, oh, okay. I'm sorry. The early scene. But later on, when you actually do get inside, get inside of uh, the craft, uh, there's curtains everywhere. <laughs> it's an amazing lack of, of any kind of equipment or anything. And they're made out of paper plates. That was the coolest thing. <laughs> I think uh, I think some of the ones that Wood used were also uh, like Remco models uh, from the late 50s as well. 
Um, so if you look at the films uh, in the 1950s that uh, did uh, offer U UFO encounters as a plot or a subplot, uh, some of them are very menacing, like War of the Worlds, uh, which is there again, a, a fantastic science fiction film. And it's, you know, it's got some age on it as well, but it holds up extremely well. Fortunately, it was shot in color. <clears throat> and I think uh, that you know, the color plus the quality of the, of the available print uh, makes War of the Worlds one of the best. And that's Gene Barry and Ann Robinson, uh, the stars of it. Uh, if you move into the 70s, you know, the, the era you know, that I grew up in as a kid, the big film from the 70s was obviously Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Uh, it was a big Steven Spielberg epic. And I will confess that I have only seen that movie once. I saw it at the theater uh, when I was probably, ooh, I don't know, like 12 or 13 years old. And I had expectations up here for it. I was really excited to see it, especially since, you know, this was the guy who made Jaws. So I was uh, really excited and hated it. <laughs> so back there for two and a half hours, like, oh, Jesus, when is this going to end? Um, I think one of the things that really threw me off in it is there are, you know, there are two different stories uh, going in the film and I got bored with it after a while. But when I was preparing for tonight, I started thinking, you know, gosh, everything about this movie is right and I really should like it. So I'm gonna give it another, I'm gonna give it another shot. Uh, it's got a great cast, um, it, incredibly high production values. And I, I remember it looking good, you know, on screen, but did not care for it. and. I'll wrap up with a, another uh, extraterrestrial film <laughs> that I despised, uh, which was E.T. Uh, and there's actually a reason behind that. The first time I saw E.T., I was probably 16 years old and I saw it at the, you know, the local theater where I grew up. And there was a, you know, the product placement got obnoxious, you know, after a while. And, you know, even my 16-year-old you know, jaded self was rolling his eyes. Uh, at it for some reason that movie stayed in the theater for i don't know two years i mean it was <laughs> it was it always seemed to be on mm -hmm. and my mother loved it so when she would get off work she would call me and ask me to meet me at the theater and i would be like oh my god do we have to see this movie again and i probably <laughs> saw it 15 mm -hmm. times uh in this from 1982 to 1983 and i i, I can't do it anymore I, I just can't watch it. Every time I see it on, I just start rolling my eyes. I, I cannot do it. I will say something, though, uh, as a big amusement park aficionado, uh, the E.T. ride at um, Universal in Florida is awesome. It's, it's so cute. I love it. I just can't watch that movie ever again. <laughs> Can you eat Reese's Pieces? <laughs> Actually, I, you know, I, I used to hate those too, and um, I got some. Uh, I can't remember. We might have had some at work uh, when I was still uh, working, and you know what? They're actually really good. Mm. So, so the, I, these are under the command of lots of different uh, other ETs or forces at work. There's no. Uh, wisdom to be from <laughs> our, our popular culture. <laughs> What's your favorite theory, Brian? I'm sorry, can you say that again? This you have, year. Do you have a favorite theory on what the aliens are doing here? Uh, well, part of me you know, wonders if they're not rolling their eyes at us. <laughs> <laughs> so so we might be here for their amusement. I think um, I, I think so. Like uh, I, I echo Dr. Timmons' book, and I, I really think we're here for their amusement, and that's the only explanation that makes sense uh, to me. There, there are parts of it, but uh, one of the parts is certainly for entertainment. And I think uh, you know a, a, another aspect of it, it goes back to Michael Rennie in the day the Earth stood still. I, I do think they are monitoring the situation just yes. to make sure that we don't blow the universe up or, or anything like that yes and, and we it wouldn't be out of a, a, intention it would be very ham-fisted you know I don't, I don't think they think that we're smart enough 
to, to handle all, all of this. And there, I would agree with that. <laughs> I would agree with that assessment. Mm -hmm. uh, but who knows? Uh, it, it could be time travel. Um, th this this could be us in a million years. I mean, who knows? You know, it, a lot of the accounts that we're told, uh, you know, from uh, you know, uh, alleged sightings uh that that have involved more than just spacecraft you know actual beings uh they are you know somewhat humanoid it's something it could have we could have evolved you know who knows thank you <laughs> and last but certainly not least mark and the invisible phyllis um, <laughs> mark and phyllis quiet. at the advantage of being in contact with uh extraterrestrials so uh, uh their view is an insider's view what light can you shed upon us? Uh, Let me see. Question. Well, I I was involved with the ET movie only because they contacted me for being a contactee who had benevolent encounter with the extraterrestrials. So their Spielberg people came to New York for me to meet them. So a lot of the movie is based on some stuff that I told them. They tape recorded me. So when they talked about home, that was what I started because uh, they said, where did you go? And when you were out of body and going back to visit with my true self. And I said, we call it home. And they use that. And also I tell them how we're telepathic and how they know where we are. And I know where they are when they're coming. I can feel them. I sense them. They look up and they're there or they communicate telepathically. So they use that with Elliot and the extraterrestrial. <clears throat> I had a golden retriever at the time at the field with me and they used a golden retriever mixed dog. So it's, they use certain things. And I asked them, are you gonna use extraterrestrial people or beings like I saw? And they said, no, he's gonna make up his own character. So we had no idea what's gonna happen after that. But it was, um, there was parts about it that I understood that I think went over the head of everybody. <clears throat> when E.T. was supposedly dying, getting sick, his energy was withdrawing and Elliot was feeling all these things and the plant was weak, wilting, etc. And he was taken in a body bag and zipped up. And Elliot was getting sicker and they were taking him out of the room. Well, in that moment, that's when E.T. goes, he, he fades out. Now, he had already done his communication device that didn't work for him. So basically what he did is went out of body to go home to get contact to come pick him up. So when he, the plant started coming back to life, when Elliot saw that, that was a connection that he realized he wasn't lost in the connection. They ran back and then Elliot, they undo his zipper bag and he goes, ET phone, home, 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 home. I knew that was the link. Only through an out of body was this guy going to get back to his people in some way to get a communication going. That's the way I saw it. Because otherwise, why would he say ET phone home when he came out of the bag? You know, they zipped him up. So unzipped him, I mean. So there's parts in that movie that were used for me and my their tape recording they made. And they didn't give me any credit in any way. Because I asked them, I said, am I supposed to sign? So you took all my information and wrote down everything I said. I had artwork and photography, UFOs I had that were documented by MUFON back then and uh they said no no it's okay we're just he's just getting an idea for a story but they basically utilized some of it too um they asked me why would these extraterrestrials sometimes come to the earth and i said a lot of them are botanists and they bring plants or take plants back so at the end she's giving them a plant because he was a botany ship if you remember the plants on shelves so i thought wow when phyllis and i first saw that movie uh we were like wow they they, they steal a lot of stuff from <laughs> But <clears throat> the Close Encounters of the Third Kind was based on lots of snippets from real life things, where probes flying through, bringing the, the turnstiles, et cetera, on the cars. A lot of things were there. And um, back in 1980 or 81, I think it was, uh, J. Allen Heine Heineck was up in Brewster giving a talk with the investigators we worked with. And we were there watching the table for the photography and whatever people wanted to look at and he requested to meet with me in the back of the stage so we got back there and he was curious about uh peter my, my investigator already told him about what we do and what happened to me so he was curious about that and he wanted to know because he was nuts and bolts everything had to be metal you know here's your spaceship i believe you that kind of stuff he didn't think there was a dimensional anything going on but i told him there was and i said and he goes how do they jump through time i said they basically bend frequency but it's also a jump through a teleport 
boom, jump. And we have spaces in the areas that they teleport with. We can go back in time. And basically they see it in the same way. I can't even explain how they do it because I've seen how they do it, but there's time warp spaces and frequencies. It's all frequency and sonics. And then they jump. And they locate the timing, like 1855 or something, and they know that time zone. We visited people in the past in uh, ancient times, so that's how they do it. And so we got to get into, is it a comedy? Is it a joke? No, it's not. It's real. And we are not just entertainment, no. Some, some of these beings might use it as that. But we are here to do things and to, uh, as souls, we came in to work and do different things for the planets as we're on the heavy duty energy or the frequency of this planet, the physical dense bodies. We are all from higher dimensional planes. <clears throat> and I knew, uh, we knew John Keel, he would visit with us here and everything because we lived a couple blocks from him. Ultra terrestrials is exactly what we're talking about. They're not of this frequency and density, they're frequency higher and we're finishing our book. So soon we'll get some out now, um, the higher densities and what we call levels. These beings come from these levels that are beyond our understanding on, on this level. We're first level. They have 12 levels. And on planes, we're first plane. And there's 12 planes. And beyond that, there's not just 12. There's beyond that. So we are very multidimensional beings, us as souls. And uh, we are in the future and there right here is an aspect. And then all the past is still there to see. You can pass away today, get on the other side work your way to the other side. And as you get there, you get to the spots and then you can ask questions. That's what you got to do. And you want to see the past. You want to see where you were in times in the past or what plant systems. You could see that, but you have to ask. It's not something that just happens when you're there. Um, these beings are located on high, so many dimensions and planes and different places from physical density like us to higher frequency. So all of them answer to their own people. So, we, we know Ashtar, I know Ashtar. I know he works with some groups here. I know other people in the other dimensional planes that we work with, like there's one called Kantamara. Uh, actually, George Bentassel spoke of him, not him, but the people who talked with him spoke about that being, that's a person I met back in the 1970s. So these beings are commanders and leaders in their way and these own, and their own, let's say groups or um, commanders and stuff in their own groups, like the intergalactic mission is a is an organiz a group of them, a galactic group. We have a galactic council. We have these intergalactic councils and they have commanders working with them. And one is Astron. <clears throat> so there's many, many commanding beings and they're all running their own different commands. So some are here, like Tim said, and Tim Beckley, as well as even, um, uh, John Keel, these beings are like, some of them are robot, robotics, and we know those are like robotic beings. They're just programmed to do certain things, get soil samples, do whatever they're doing, get a clip of a leaf or whatever, and go back on the ship. And the beings who sent them in that physical density spaceship of sorts are on a higher place in another dimensional plane, maybe. And so they go back in frequency. But those are robotics, the robotic type android things. So there are humanoids or beings that I've met, and the ones I met were eight and nine feet tall, but they picked me up. I was a little kid too, and I was five years old. So they picked me up and carried me. When I got older, I went on the same ships, and these were teleported level to, uh, beings of light that would take you up in a beam. So I'm not saying, I, I say anyone can believe what they want, but I know what I experienced. And where I come from. And I've never forgotten where I've come from before I came in to be born here. So there are many commands. There are many beings that are meeting up with other, let's say, command hosts or command beings on other galaxies as well as planet systems. So we can't say they're all talking to one person or one guy in control, like Ashtar or somebody like that. No, there's different groups. And they always said, we come to our own. So like Michael, that's what they do. They come to their own, those who we've been with, who we've worked with in the past or who we've come from before coming here. So they come to monitor and they and they will just monitor us. Sometimes they come through and they'll, you'll see them in the sky, levitate and they'll hover above you. 
and then flash off, just go away or go like that. They're just checking in and monitoring. They know what's going on in this planet, and that's why they can shut off certain uh, bomb systems and stuff when needed. And just like Michael Rennie, the same thing, and they're, they're so still. Uh, when they came here in the 50s and 51 and 52, the beings that came were from the Ethereum range of frequency dimensions. Not this de density that we are, but higher, finer frequency densities, but they can come through to us because these densities are right near each other, these levels and stuff. And so one level can affect another in how they do things. So launching a bomb here maybe affects the frequencies on some of the levels. And that's what they were complaining about, I think, when they first came, because they saw the bombs were going off and they're saying, well, they're affecting us now. Now we got to monitor them even closer. But they've monitored for thousands and millions of years. Millions. And on that and note, watching us. we need to wrap up because everybody needs to share the context. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. Okay. Uh, what do you call it? I, I am, of course, joking to some degree, but not totally when I say that uh, part of this is entertainment, because as you know, my spirituality and my origin is Olympian. So we have an Olympian view of things. And part of that is uh, having a sense of humor and being entertained by what is going on in the world of the here and now. So uh, thank you very much. And Phyllis, I, we missed your voice. Uh, we're gonna look forward to it next time. Phyllis, they missed your voice back there. You wait. <laughs> Just saying hi. Well, I was listening to everybody. She was listening to us all. <laughs> I, I want to thank everybody for your contact information. Um, obviously, 10 minutes is not enough. For, you know, So we can do one of two things. And I'd like to know, it doesn't have to be now, what you would prefer personally. We could either start from 8.30 and go to 10 rather than 9 o'clock. That's option number one. Option number two is that we have four instead of five uh, uh, people speaking. And this way, everybody gets uh, a bit more time to speak. So uh, I will ask everybody individually by PM or email or by telephone. Uh, so that's something to think about. Um, how can people get in contact with you, Tim Schwartz? And on press. Sure. Well, if uh, uh, if you want to read all my books, they're all available on uh, uh, Amazon.com. Just type in my name, Tim R. Swartz, and they'll all come tumbling out for your reading pleasure, both uh, print and uh, ebooks. Uh, you can also find some of them at your favorite uh, local bookstore or your library. So uh, uh, please patronize both. Uh, our website is, and I, I really do need to go and uh, update it, but it's uh, a conspiracyjournal.com. Uh, that's, uh, uh, you can find uh, a lot of the articles and uh, and other books uh, by some of our other authors that uh, wrote for uh, Tim uh, Timothy Green Beckley's Global Communications, especially. And that's uh, conspiracyjournal.com, uh, uh, where we like to say we've got all the weird news and information that they don't want you to know. And I can that. <laughs> <laughs> How can people contact you? Okay. You can get me at uh, Michael K. Waterman on Facebook. You can get me on a uh, phone, a wizard, which is my other job um, uh, at Facebook. You can get me on my home phone number, which has not changed everybody. It's 516-650-3691. Please write that down. Oh, you can get me, you can write to me. And it's now 1699 Chatham, C-H-A-T-H-A-M uh, Parkway, uh, apartment 1523A, Savannah, Georgia, 31407. Um, and you can reach me, of course, through Hercules, if you wish. Um, I will also be on my own show as well, MNN, you can get me there, or you can, of course, reach me right here. There are many ways to reach you, but some of them have alligators, so beware. Um, <laughs> and rattlesnakes, I hear. <laughs> Brian Walker, how can people visit the Drive-In Theater and speak with you? Well, you can always visit the Drive-In Theater 24-7 at uh, briansdriveintheater.com. That's Brian with an I. And if you want to interact with me on social media, your only chance is through Facebook because I'm it's the only social media platform I seem to be active on anymore. Uh, if you run a search for Brian's Drive-In Theater in Facebook, I will come up. Thank you very much. And uh, just before we move on to Mark, um, Setna is one of uh, 
Mount Olympus's major sages and seers. Uh, and very soon I'll be having uh, uh, major sages and seerly panels, just like we have the UFO panel. So if anyone's interested in divine happenings and ancient mythologies and how they live in the modern day, uh, either as uh, a uh, panelist or, you know, an audience member or whatever, uh, just let me know and we'll put you in the rotation. And uh, Mark uh, and I had a conversation maybe a year ago or two years ago at this point about yeah. At some point, uh, uh, investigating the paranormal, it was two years ago because because uh, yeah. uh, uh, COVID hadn't happened yet. So it was before you started the the show, just yes. before. So we were talking about uh, going here in Jersey, in the in New York, New York State, and the surrounding states, and investigating uh, cryptids <laughs> and UFOs and things like that. I've done that in the past, and so have uh, many of you, including Mark and Phyllis. So that got put on hold because of the pandemic. Uh, but now, even though the pandemic is still with us, it's no longer as with us as it was before, at least insofar as how people are reacting to it. So yeah. that's going to be starting the second quarter of uh, this year. Right now, I'm working on the UFO investigations, which is, have started already. So we're going to be investigating UFOs. Later, we'll be investigating cryptids. So, Mark, how can people contact you and Phyllis and align themselves with the forces that you represent? Well, before I end my, my whole show, this is my commander, Sananda, mm -hmm. and he runs a lot of everything, everywhere in the gal galaxy and the omniverse. Um, uh, also, Michael, don't forget, Michael, don't forget brown recluses are there, the spider, <laughs> and black moccasins. And my oh. cat seems to be eating spiders, so that <laughs> seems to be fun. I hope it's not that one. <laughs> I don't know, but... But Oliver seems to think that everything is delicious. Big bugs. Oliver. Ew. Oliver. Um, <laughs> and the hairy Oliver, ones. Oliver uh, sneaking up on us. He's a beautiful cat. Um, oh, he you is. Can read, you can get us on uh, Facebook under Mark Murgoff. Uh, Mark, Mark. And uh, what do you call it? Our website, intergalacticmission.com. And the other website, etuniversalzone.com where we play with Hercules and we have interviews, et cetera. YouTube under Mark. And YouTube, Phyllis just said, under Mark Brinkhoff. M-A-R-C. M-A-R-C, B-R-I-N-K-E-R-H-O-F-F. -F. And I don't know. Uh, and Mark Telegram, I don't know. Yahoo. Yahoo. Mark Brinkhoff at yahoo.com. That's So <laughs> we're finishing here. some books, guys. And Come here. Come here. So, oh, the cat. Oh, so yeah. we're going to be finishing our books. We're working on another one just now, finishing more. And I'm available for <laughs> soul readings, what do you want to call these things? I call them spiritual consultations, where I can see into your past and also know but your other people, your overpart mm -hmm. and past lives, et cetera, even for your pets. I don't know, whatever. It's just mm -hmm. that and angels. No, I don't know any of that. I think that's basically it. In, in conclusion, I just want to add a little bit something to what Mark and Phyllis are saying. Uh, Mark and Phyllis's forces are real. Um, what do you call it? Uh, I know personally because there are there's much I share about my life, but there's a lot that I don't. Yes, <laughs> I have certain pieces of information that I just don't share. So, <laughs> Phyllis and Mark and I first started uh, talking. Sometimes on the air and sometimes off the air, they told me a lot of things that I hadn't shared ever. You know, so <laughs> whatever you may believe about how they're presenting themselves. Uh, what do you call it? And uh, you know, everyone, like Mark said, is open to their own ideas. There is a reality to them. Uh, when we used to have uh, the uh, uh, Duncans on also, the Duncans did the same thing. And uh, a couple of times the Duncans and uh, uh, Mark had said the exact same thing in the exact same words. So whatever the phenomenon is, and the, what do you call it? For some people, there's still questions about the phenomenon. It, 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 there is a reality to it uh, beyond the words that uh, you know we're hearing from them. Okay. So, yeah, and we all get it to us the way it comes to us, and we interpret it through our, ourselves too, and um, or past lives, whatever people have experienced, you know, and there it comes to them. Don't go anywhere, boo boo. I know oh, he's you. beautiful. <laughs> what a beautiful cat. Well, oh, he's my buddy. And Brian, <laughs> Mark, and Phyllis, and Sedna, and Boo Boo, have, have a wonderful rest of your evening. Thank you so very much for being here. And I look yeah. forward to 
next uh, conversation on Rothier. Everybody. Good everybody. Good night, everybody. Bless and blessed be. Good night.